Well, good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Lori Davis here this morning hosting the Today Show on this wonderful fall Thursday here in the Northwest. If you're anywhere else, if you're in the Southwest, you're burning up because they're having triple digit digit uh, degrees and heat in California. And uh, hello to all of our California colleagues and hope you're uh, staying cool down there. On Thursdays, as you know, we feature a specialized community. And uh, today uh, I have asked and invited a new friend of mine, Jessica Hutton, Hutton, I better get it right, uh, to join us uh, because she's had some pretty great adventures uh, within the Indigenous and Northern communities. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's see, do we have any announcements? Um, no, not today. I think we're good. Uh, tomorrow we'll be featuring uh, the beautiful Sylvia Somerville from Niagara Falls, Ontario, and Sylvia has a new number one bestseller, and we're going to talk to her, and she's on our team, so it's really fun to bring our family in here and uh, feature them on the show. So without further ado, let's bring uh, Jessica to the stage. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, and thank you for coming on board in short notice. We've only met last Friday. We've hardly known each other just a week. And this is our third meeting, our third gathering, if you will. And uh, thank you for stepping up and being able to be here today. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Thank you mm -hmm. for having me. It's wonderful to talk about things that bring us so much passion. That's right. That's right. So in my uh, exchanges with you just this past week, I know you've had quite the journey, quite the adventure um, lots of experience uh, out there in the working world. So let's start with a, a, a story because you've been to Nunavut a number of times. And I even had the name of the community incorrect. So this is an educational broadcast. So you need to help us with some of the things that if I say something that's not correct, I really appreciate uh, the editing, if you don't mind, because a lot of times we think we know things. And we don't we don't know anything. So so how did you get to Nunavut? Yeah, that's a bit of a story. And that's you know, to your point about the the Nunavut, when I went to high school, Nunavut wasn't a territory yet. So I think in a lot of ways, in our defense of some of the generations that haven't learned that, we don't necessarily know because it wasn't something that it just used to be all you know sort of Northwest territories. So right. Nunavut is a territory now on its own. Um, but they're really, it's only been about 25 years or less that they've been their own, you know, governing territory. So I think that's part of the, the reason as well, is that some of us that's still, you know, we're still learning what that looks like. So okay. um, there, the territory of Nunavut has about 38,000 people in it and a number of remote communities. So really the only way to get into most of the communities is through plane. Um, or in the summertime when it, the, the ice is melted, you can go in on a, on a boat. Um, which is how they get their their supplies in. So it was a really interesting story around how I got up to Nunavut. Um, I was working as a CEO for a social services organization um, based in Alberta here and doing a lot of work within um, very specific communities, including Indigenous communities, um, and doing integrated response. And so just kind of changing how we were responding to some very vulnerable communities. Um, and I actually was working alongside uh, a detachment of the RCMP um, that was very, very forward thinking and very, very um, interesting in how they wanted to approach things. And one of the members had worked in and out of Nunavut for many, many years. And, and he kept saying to me over and over, you know, you really need to come to Nunavut. I think that what you're doing here, you know, could really work up there. And I thought, how interesting for an RCMP member to sort of, uh, you know, and he just he was working in Ed or he was back in Alberta for his couple of years and then he was going back up. So he went back up there and we stayed in touch and he just kept saying, you know, you really need to come up here and look at this. And so finally I thought, I have to go off and see what is, what's going on here. So I flew into community um, and flew in. So you, you generally you fly in um, to the to the capital of Kanoet. Um, and so flow it fly in and then I went out into the smaller community that I went into. So the smaller community I was in was called Kingite or its Western name is Cape Dorset. 
Um, and so I flew into this community and, you know, just sort of met this community of about 1200 people, um, met everybody and really got to understand what he was talking about and very quickly realized why he had said the way that the work that I was doing would work up there. Um, and so at that point, I sort of looked around and thought, okay, yeah, no, I can understand why and what's going on. Had some very interesting experiences up there that first time. Um, and then came back out and, and it took a number of, of times of going up and down and some real interesting planning before actually getting some, some programming off the ground. But it just taught me so much about, about Canada and about, you know, what the needs are and, and individuals and, and how we respond to those needs and what, you know, what we can do differently and how we can work differently. It was just, it's been profound in terms of my experience, both professionally and personally. Yeah. Wow. Now you've got me fired up and I want to go. Yes. Wow. That'd yes. be amazing. It is a beautiful community. Wow. So we've both worked um, on and off reserves for years. I mean, if we were to combine our years together, uh, you know, it would be a lot. And um, from your perspective, what do you see? What do you think right now, right now, today, because you and I can talk about this forever, but what do you think, or what do you know are the biggest challenges right now within our Indigenous communities or Inuit Syst communities? Yeah. System navigation. Okay. Can you expand yeah. on that? Absolutely. In a lot of ways um, across across Canada, and, and I'm making quite a broad statement here because this isn't going to be true in every community, but there is access to services or access to funding for services but trying to connect the dots between a community and the resource is where things tend to break down um you know if you kind of go onto the the government website at government canada website at any given time there is a lot of grants out there that are available but they take time and effort to complete and somebody has to know how to write them and somebody has to know how to measure the outcomes and deliver on the outcomes and implement them and operationalize them and and that's just one area where that system you know navigation is very very complex the other side of that is, is when you have communities that are in crisis, which we very much know we do, we have an opioid crisis, we have had suicide crisis. When I was working up north um, in Nunavut, in the span of three weeks, we had two mamas that committed suicide and left behind a combined seven children. And that, you know, that just, it rocks the community. And so in that moment, when you're everybody is touched in that community by that death and then two deaths and actually there was two more deaths that had happened within that month it was an awful month in that moment you know we can't ask people to try to navigate a system they're they're trying to navigate their grief they're trying to navigate themselves and that's where i keep seeing these systems fall down is that yes you know we're we're looking and we're like well there is money and there is resources yes there is but trying to close that gap is the problem. And one of the examples I use repeatedly when I talk about this is I had cancer. When I had cancer and I was diagnosed, my world was rocked. I had just had my son. He was a month old. I was diagnosed with cancer. They didn't look at me and say, well, you're going to have to figure it out. There's all these resources and things, but you know, figure it out. They literally hand you, they take over your care plan. They hand you your dates where you need to be. There's a specialized hospital for that. They tell you where you need to be, when you need to be there, everything. And when you get into the hospital, everybody's there to help you. Which way do you need to go? Do you need food? Do you need water? This is what your plan's going to look like. And I think about that and I think, you know, that's the only, like if you would have left it to me, I would have, I, there's no way I could have gone through that journey on my own. So why aren't we dealing with some of these communities and situations exactly the same way? Um, you know, stepping in and giving that life-saving help. We step in and give that life-saving help to someone like me who had cancer. So that's, you know, my, when I look at these types of situations, I think, oh my goodness, you know, I, I know we can do it because look, we do it for cancer, but we're not necessarily connecting the dots on some of these more vulnerable communities. Right. That's a very good example. It's just been two years too that I had cancer surgery two years ago in September. And you're right. Uh, you know, it was early stage. I, I mean, I'm cancer free. I didn't have any treatments or anything like that. But at the same time, I went to my doctor and yeah. the very next day I'm into uh, Devon for an ultrasound. Yeah. Uh, I traveled outside of my town for the ultrasound just so I could get in more quickly. And the plan was in motion. Yeah, and exactly. I had never been sick. 
So I'd had no, you know, I hadn't been in the hospital in years. Yeah. So it was yeah. interesting uh, what you're saying. I'm connecting to that. So congratulations for you still being here and me still being here. Absolutely. Right. That but we're here because people stepped in and gave us a plan. Right. And isn't that the ironic piece? How many people who, you know, like, like, let's not look at it from cancer, but even the opi opioid crisis, you know, what, what do we generally say? Well, they got to hit rock bottom. Not even, no. I do not subscribe to that at all. That is the wrong way to look at it. And so for me, you know, what are we going to do if we look at somebody with cancer? Well, we got to hit rock bottom. Well, no, no, we, I don't think we so. Deal with it. Right. So, I mean, here you and I are because there's a plan and there's a way and there's a process to deal with it. And people navigated our systems for us mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. But I'll never forget the feeling that came over me when I was yep. told that I had cancer. I agree. I went like I couldn't have made I couldn't have made a peanut butter sandwich. I was so absolutely devastated. And here you and I are significant amount of of credentials and training and all the things. And you and I freely admit we could not both of us could not have made a decision when we got that news. I it was all I could I do to breathe and life. And so then I look at that and I think, OK, us with all of the skills and capacities and coping that we have couldn't do that. So then now let's equate it to communities where there is resiliency issues and there is well-being issues. Exactly. Right on. I mean, as individuals, we had we have a lot to pull from to get us through life, to get us through yes. situations, right? You know, in, a, in all aspects of our life, financially, physically, uh, emotionally, Absolutely. everything. Yeah. So where does that leave somebody who doesn't have that? Yeah, exactly. exactly. In the ditch. In the ditch. Well, and just that disconnection. I mean, we we know that connection is the opposite of addiction and opposite of suicide ideation and all of these things. And if you don't even have an I, I, I mean, I for my situation, I had a strong tribe around me of, you know, right. friends and, and family and all of that around me. And that also helped my coping, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you did, too. And so then again, what does that look like in communities where people don't have that, where everybody around them is either unwell or has passed away and they don't have that connection and they then you know we know that their resiliency is down we know their well-being is down and now they're at higher risk so where does that leave communities when we have this this complete disconnection of a person in there and then we you know we wonder it's, it's to me it's not rocket science why people look for substances then like of course you look for a substance because that right. is a, a massive way of coping and making that pain go away um, and so from my perspective, you know, when we stand back and look at that, you know, targeting, targeting what we put into communities needs to reflect on the larger impact of the trauma and the well-being and the resilience, not the band-aids of some of the smaller issues that it, I mean, multi-pronged approach and you and I could talk for hours on that multi-pronged yeah, approach, but, but we do need to look at, you know, all aspects and really be targeting that one end as well too. Right. Exactly. Uh, there was something you said there. Oh, yes. Uh, because in our communities, there's this constant, they're in a constant state of grieving. Yes. They just get one person, yep. rest in peace, buried. Mm -hmm. And you and I were at a funeral on Friday. Mm -hmm. That's where we met. And uh, as I'm going into the, to the uh, building, there's a lady coming out of the building crying she had come to go to the funeral and while she was in there found out that her grandson had died right there. So we're going into a funeral. Yeah. She has to come out because she's devastated yeah. and uh, grabs onto our friend who is in a in grief. So how can that support yeah. be provided when people are in a constant state of grief? Yeah. Wow. And I have seen that happen over and yeah. over and over. And it's, um, from the outside, um, so I, I actually had a con an interesting conversation with an RCMP member about this one time, and we were in we were up in Nunavut, and there had just been passing like this bad month had just been really bad, and and the member just kind of said to me, and, and it it wasn't out of a place of, of judgment or or you know any like you just he was commenting on something he didn't understand, and he said you know I've never seen anything like it. Everybody's just so shut off, like they just don't care that somebody died, and I thought hold on. <laughs> It's not that they don't care. It's that everybody is at max coping and there's zero more brain space left. There's absolutely no more brain space left to deal, like to actually 
deal with the fact to actually even process that another person has died because the brain is so shut down. And so, I mean, that has long-term uh, issues as well, too, is that when that brain shuts down, then now we're at some point, we're going to have to go backwards and we're going to have to, you know, let the brain deal with all of that. But just looking at, at providing that education around too, it's, it's not that somebody doesn't care. It's that they're literally tapped out and they're coping. And yes, it is. It, I mean, it's not that they're necessarily even jaded and it they just don't have anything left to to respond with when it's one after the next after the next and you cannot get your you cannot even get your feet underneath you we know grief is a process but when you stack up you know 50 processes in you know 10 years that's a lot absolutely well we're going to take a little break 30 seconds and this is where i share with my audience that if you have a business an event coming up a book you want to promote um a service uh, you can actually advertise on our show for for very good prices. So uh, it kind of looks like this. And people go, 30 seconds, that's it? But yes, so I'm just going to put up a 30-second clip of what 30 seconds looks like. Because this is where you could be featured if that's something you'd like to do. So here we go. It looks like this. And this is snowflakes flying up into the sky. The day is set. Join us October 12th, 2024 at Kerrigan Arms for our next fundraiser in honor of veterans, the Invictus Games in British Columbia, Canada, and TDC Employment Program Enrollment. For more information, email us at info at the disabilitychannel.ca. Introducing Veteran House Alliance International Monthly 5050 Raffle. Purchase your ticket today, link on display, and have a chance to win cash and help a great platform supporting veterans. Welcome back, everyone. You're watching the Today Show here on the Disability Channel. I'm Dr. Lori Davis and my guest today, Jessica Hutton. And Jessica and I have similar work experience and passionate about some of the things, that, some of the same things. And so I met her just last week and uh, we've had a couple of uh, times to get together. So I just really uh, appreciate you, Jessica, coming in and um, sharing some of your journey with us. So the next segment, uh, I'd love for you to tell us uh, and describe the community to us, the, that territory, Nunavut. Uh, give us a picture, paint us a picture, because I've never been there. And so when you, you know, what did you see while you were there? What observations did you make? Absolutely. It is beautiful. It is, it is so different than, well, obviously than the rest of Alberta. So it is tundra. The, the edge that I was on um, is the tundra side. So that's the east side. Um, if you look on a map, um, Nunavut spans multiple time zones and a significant part of the north part of the country. Um, and I didn't realize that either when I started traveling up there, how wide that territory is. So I was more on the east end, so that is tundra. Um, I was up to Nunavut in every single season and multiple Ooh. times. And that's a really interesting experience. So the first time I ever went was uh, it was the end. It was October. It was actually over Thanksgiving weekend. And it's a real, that's that at that point, it was relatively neutral time. So it was just sort of winter hadn't hit. It was just sort of like Alberta in in, you know, November sort of thing. Um, and it's, it is beautiful. It's tundra. So it's all rock. Um, and then you're with the Arctic ocean around there. So it is different wildlife, of course. Um, and then I flew up uh, numerous times when the snow hit. Um, and that's very interesting to go in when it's full of snow. I was also there during a blizzard. And I can emphatically say that even as living in Alberta, I have never experienced a blizzard like I have up on the tundra. Um, and then also in the summertime when there's um, beautiful little tundra flowers, that the tundra blooms, the, the, and it just is absolutely stunning um, with the water. And and it's so it's a beautiful community. There's their, their sources of food are different to belugas, um, seals, walruses, things like that. Um, and I actually had the pleasure of landing um, in the middle of a beluga hunt one time. So we landed on the plane and we hear all these crack of gunshots, which of course, when you're flying into your community, you're not really sure what that means, but they're hunting belugas. And so the killer whales had had chased a pot of belugas and they'd come in the, the bay. And so then they were harvesting belugas. And that was just absolutely amazing to see the what the rituals are like and how the population works. Um, there it is such a beautiful culture um the the inuit culture is just absolutely beautiful 
Um, and so the working together and the way that they harvest, like for example, in a beluga hunt, the way that they harvest, all the children are there. Um, the children are, are learning from their fathers and, and from their grandfathers. Um, the mums are out there and the grandmas are out there. They harvest the belugas a certain way. Um, certain parts of the belugas are reserved only for the women to eat and there are celebrations around them. Um, and so it's a very, it's a very beautiful culture. Um, when you look at the the Inuit culture, they have a certain um, set of values, and and every um, they are they articulate those values very clearly on everything they do, and that's also very beautiful. Is that you can always sort of be working the way that you that I was working programming up there, always attached back to values, and so it was it was wonderful. The the children up there, um, I just adored working with the children up there. They're just such fun little monkeys, and. It's, they, they don't have in a lot of ways, in a lot of communities, some they do, but in a lot of the communities, they don't have access to um, what we would have access to in the South around toys and, and, you know, things like that. And so just watching the kids and how they play um, is just, it, it's just mesmerizing. I absolutely loved working with the kids. It's a very, uh, the communities are very small. And so when a plane lands, everybody knows the plane lands. Like it's, it's not like, you know, an airport at image, like that plane comes in, you hear it, you know, um, you know, when a medevac's coming in and out, you know, when anything's happening. So when that plane comes in, oftentimes the kids will know who's on it. Um, and they'll be waiting at the airport. And I think one of the most profound experiences I ever had was maybe uh, the fourth or fifth time I went back, I was taking staff in for the first time and everybody knew we were coming back with staff. Um, and it was still at the time that we were, it must, it must've been at the end of COVID. Um, but COVID was finished, but we were still masked on an airplane because I remember coming off the airplane and I was in a mask. Um, and I walked in the door of the airport and we're talking about like, it's just a little room. You just come through the door. And I was looking up at where I was going and I just peripherally caught this rocket just right into me, right at my weight. And it, it got me. And it was this little girl that I had seen every single time. And I just, she was so beautiful. She was about four or five. And she just had come and right around my legs. And and I had, and, and, you know, I, I had a mask on. Like I thought, how did she even recognize me without the mask on? And I just, I have this beautiful picture that the person picking me up at the airport snapped of these three children. And I, sometimes I see that picture and I just see in my eyes, the smile that I have because these kiddos, just the hope of bringing some of the stuff that we are bringing into community for them. Um, and just like those types of experiences, like it just, it, it profoundly impacts you and how you do your work so differently because you can see in real time the impact that you know bringing some of these things even just basic needs we brought in a lot of basic needs how that impacts the community wow so um what kinds of things would you bring in like what would be an example of of taking things there yeah what have you taken? um so i uh, personally i took up um i took up a lot of interesting things uh one trip i took up i sent up baby clothes i took up just all of anything I could diapers, baby clothes, all of those types of things. Um, there's a, there's a lot of mamas in need. And so I took up just suitcases of that. There's a really, um, there's a group of, of individuals up there that sort of do, a, 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 I don't know how to describe it. They have a charity that they sort of package up things for new mamas that needed in communities and, and fly it into new communities. So I'd taken up a whole bunch of that, but then through my work, we took up things like, um, stickers for the kids and art for the kids and you know some of these things that the kids didn't necessarily like a lot of craft stuff we took up for the summertime in the programming the kids mm -hmm. um in the summertime need to have a lot to do and so we took up a lot of different things we could do outside with them a lot of different crafts um those types of things we took up but we also took up i mean we took up things like food so that we could provide a little bit of basic needs but we also then the better way we found of doing that was to start tapping into two funding and grants and have it shift into the community. So then what we would do would we would um, tap into a grant and then we would be able to go to the co-op locally and purchase, you know, a, a whole bunch of different food or things. We also were able to um, identify through um, and start using Jordan's principal or, or um, Inuit Children's uh -huh. First. And we were able to get beds and mattresses and you know we had oh. three cargo planes worth of beds and mattresses and pi pillows oh. and blankets and all that flown into the community we were able to access that we were able to access a whole 
winter gear, all sorts of stuff for kiddos in the community through that initiative as well, too. So we were able to push a lot, like to be the conduit to push a lot. And when I talk about system navigation, that's the piece is you need that conduit. You know, I had staff who knew how to fill out those papers and knew and could, you know, just whip through the papers and knew what they needed. That's a lot for somebody who's never seen an 11 page application for something, you know, before right. and doesn't know how to fill it out. Right. So when you have that staff member that can do it, you can expedite getting assistance into a community big time. Wow. So what kind of services exist in the community itself? Like, do they have a health center? Do they have schools? Can you help us out with that a little bit? Yeah. So most of the communities, yes, they have schools um, that are, most of the individuals that work in Nunavut are, are obviously in, in, in terms of like schools and health centers. There's a lot of people that are brought in from outside of the community. Um, so you've got teachers and nurses and, and all of that that are flying into the community to provide services. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, of course, you have to work it that way. Um, that can put a strain back on, you know, if somebody comes into the community and is unaware of, of some of the maybe finer dynamics of a community. Um, but there is generally a health center and an RCMP detachment. Um, but again, all of those are, are supplied by most of the time outside the community. And so the the health centers in the time frame that I was in that community, the health center did shut down a couple of times. They just didn't have enough staff. Um, and that's a concern is, you know, of course, then, and especially if you're working in a community and you have staff in community and the health center is down and you're thinking, oh man, like, <laughs> where yeah. are we going? But you just kind of like, it is what it is. Like, what are you going to do? Um, and so, you know, there's sort of situations like that. The larger communities will have like a Callaway, the capital has a hospital. Um, but a lot of times, for example, the mamas are all flown out to have their babies and they may or may oh. not have them in Nunavut. Oh, and that's wow. another piece that really, you know, for me, I mean, I understand that when you just have a health center that may or may not have one or two nurses there, how, that's a risk to take to have a mama give birth there. Um, but we also know the impact of, you know, a mama having to be flow, flown out. So there's things yeah. like that, you know, that anytime there's a mental health crisis, somebody is flown out immediately. And we, we know, and I mean, it. I'm you and I are professionals in that field. We understand the risk of, of why somebody would be flown out versus keeping them in the community. But we also know what that does on mm -hmm. the impact of a, a culture, an impact of a community, an impact on that person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. So uh, let's talk a little bit about... Um, and I don't, I mean, I'm, I could assume a lot of things because of where I've been, but I have not been there. Um, so politically, how do they run? Do they have a chief, just like we do in the Indigenous Community South? What does their political structure look like? Yeah, no, so there's not the same setup as there would be in a, in a First Nations with a chief and council. Um, the Nunavut is a, is a government, so they uh, elect their politicians from their each zone, just, just like we would in a provincial election. Okay. Um, and then they choose who the prime minister, or sorry, not prime minister, the premier is out of that group of people. Okay. Um, so, you, so you're not necessarily voting. So it, it is a voting um, structure in terms of you vote for who you want representing the government. There's one MP, a member of parliament, and that person um, is uh, also is voted. And so their political structure is you know, very, it, there's a mix of individuals who have grown up and were raised, you know, in the territory and then individuals who have maybe moved into the territory. Um, a lot of the administration, you know, is a mix as well, too. Um, and then, you know, their, their, cal or their uh, ministers, you know, would be the same setup as we would have in the province of Alberta or any of our provinces where they have uh, their assigned ministers and they would have their, their cabinet and such. So it's just okay. a smaller, um, a smaller dynamic, of course, right? Like it's, it, there's only okay. 38,000 people, so it's a smaller dynamic. So I tended, the work that I did, I tended to work quite closely with government um, and, and actually developed a really good friendship with one of the, the ministers who was um, a truly beautiful lady who was um, half um, Inuk and she um, was able to just, she was able to provide me with so much insight, having lived, um, you know, both in the territory and out of the territory and being part of that culture. And she just, the, the insight that she was able to provide to me and the hours of sitting and talking and learning that I did from her were so incredibly valuable. Nice, nice. 
So um, tell me a little bit about um, the educational system. Does it just go up to a certain grade? Do they have to go outside for post-secondary? You know, what's that look like? So the it, it's structured the same way K to 12 as okay. we are here. Um, and the schools are, the community I was in, I can't speak to all the communities. Um, I, I mean, I've been told it's relatively the same from the work that I've done, but the community that I was in, um, I worked closely with two different principals who were just genuinely beautiful people, really, really working in the schools to to make a difference. There is some extra dynamics that you see in that community around um, kids that are, are hungry, um, kids that maybe aren't sleeping. Um, one of the things when we got into the community um, I that I excuse me, paid attention to right away was the kids, the amount of kids that didn't have beds. And so if you have one house and two beds and 12 people living in the house, who's sleeping when and on what? And so, you know, that was sort of like, okay, like people are sleeping in shifts and, you know, then the kiddos aren't sleeping. And so then they're tired in the morning and they're not coming to school or they're falling asleep at school. And, you know, of course, the immediate response to that is like, well, you need to bring your child to school. Okay, but hold on, why aren't these kiddos coming to school? And so in the work that, that the agency that I was with did, we got a whole bunch of beds into communities. And, and part of that, you know, we got bunk beds that kids were able to sort of cover with a sheet around to create their own little space. We knew the value in that. We knew the amount of having, what, what having a bed would do, that, that just that one thing would create a space that they could have their own safe space to go to. They could lay on a, you know, even during the day and they've got their space and then they could sleep at night. Um, and we were like this little things like that. You you have to go into a community and you have to live there for a while to understand that, to kind of be able to see, OK, actually, I don't think it's this. It's that these kiddos don't have a bed, you know, so it's little things right. like that. Um, and so we were able to do to get some of that help in. But within the schools, there definitely is. Um, I had a situation one day where I you know, was saw a little a little guy in school. Um, he only wasn't little. He was in the high school um, just you know, we were working with the RCMP and we were able to go into the school and, and take a look at a situation where um, this young man had, you know, sort of what we were told was he had been, he had threatened suicide. He'd had a, a pair of scissors, he threatened suicide. And so I, I you know, of course, that's a big, that, that is a big deal. Of course it is. But I'm thinking, you know, I'm not sure I, I can entirely, I, I'm not sure where I'm sitting on this. So I was able to get in and, and have a conversation with him. I, I, I got in and, and sat down beside him and and, you know, I kind of, I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, and, and, and you and I both, I think, have the same background of training around psychology and counseling. And, you know, I'm looking at him and I'm kind of doing an assessment, just watching. And I'm, I'm seeing that he's kind of vibrating a little bit. And it, it, I thought, that's interesting. That's often the vibration you see when somebody is, their blood sugar is off. And I'm, okay, you know, like, and, and so he's very upset and he's kind of coming around it. And I asked over my shoulder, I, someone go get me a granola bar and a juice box, please. And they're like, well, you know, we're not really sure we should put that into the room. And I, no, seriously, go get this for me. I think I can solve this. So sure enough, he has two juice boxes and a granola bar. And then immediately he's back and his eyes are clear and everything. And I'm like, buddy, when's the last time you ate? Two days ago. And it was a small bowl of rice. That kid was blood sugars. We're all like, that that was not a kiddo like he had an outburst of anger he's starving he's like of course and so at that point it's like okay 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 we're not we're not going to approach this in a punitive way of a kiddo you know causing disrespect or causing it no this is a kiddo who had a reaction because of no food and so that was where that sort of marrying of you know, how do we look at things differently? And I, I worked really closely with the RCMP up there and that, that, that the points that I was working up there, the RCMP were an amazing team up there. Amazing. And, and they're, they're one leader they, they, I worked with two of their, their detachment commanders up there. Amazing, amazing gentlemen who really saw the need in the community and saw how to approach the need in the community very differently. And that will be the impact of what will change things. We welcome you to advertise and promote your goods and services and or brand your logo to 34 million subscribers on Canada Talks 167. Your investment will go towards our employment programs in the media industry for persons with disabilities and veterans. Right. Wow. That's, that's an amazing story. So what about economic development? What about, um, you know, business startups, um, 
trade, um, anything along those lines, do you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on or not going on there? It's not super my area of expertise. I was more in the service delivery area. Yeah. Um, I mean, for sure, um, there. I know there was incentives for business startup. I know there was incentives for going to, to university. A lot of that you had to go out of um, the territory for, but they were also beginning to bring in the universities to be able to, you know, do virtual or, or you know, start in high school. Um, so I, I saw that coming. Um, in terms of, it, it really depends where you are in the territory for what the business is. That, you know, the, the Northwest Territory end has quite a bit different business than the, the other end does. I'm just by nature yeah. of, you know, I mean, Alberta's the same, right? So right. It, it totally depends on where you're at. It is interesting, the, the planning that has to go in. So in order to get supplies into a community, you're either flying it in, which is very expensive, or you're bringing it in on a, a freighter and you're sea lifting it in. So you're bringing the big cargo you know, out around okay. the corner to, and then they have to drag in off a barge, um, all of your big um, sea cans full of supplies. So you have to plan out your year ahead of time. So it's not like you can keep building year round. You, you can't stuff stops, right? Like you, you, if you're out of supplies, you're out of supplies. So you have to plan for your whole, like in three months, you need everything delivered. That's going to get you through the whole rest of the year. If that's building, if that's, so it, it is sometimes slow, you know, if something goes down or a power line goes down or something needs to be fixed or like fixing cars, like what, what do you do? Like, do you have a mechanic in the community? If you don't, you're waiting for a mechanic to fly in and hoping that he's got the parts. So it, it's in a lot of ways, things like that are quite a bit slower. In the capital, it is faster. You know, they certainly, they have hotels and they have, you know, a little bit different industry that's going on. In some of these smaller communities, the, just the sheer weight for supplies to come in can completely hamper, you know, every single police vehicle that I was in had something like broken windows, broken, broken, broken. You just, you can't keep up with, with right. it, right? There's just not a capacity. So. You know, that I think is it's also hampers your capacity to, to uh -huh. develop things. So how long of a trip is it to fly there from, Ed, let's say, from Edmonton to where oh you were? <laughs> what it's supposed to take or what it does take or what <laughs> I've experienced? <laughs> All of the above. It, it has taken me um, three days to get up there at times where I you just sit in airports for hours. So theoretically speaking, I think it's like about if you... you you could fly Edmonton to Ottawa, Ottawa to a Callaway, and then out of a Callaway, you can fan into all your little communities. You can also fly Edmonton to Yellowknife, Yellowknife to Rankin Bay, and then in that way as well too. Um, if you if everything runs on time, going here to Ottawa, Ottawa, and then into a community for me should have taken about thirteen hours. All said and done, um, I don't think it ever took me thirteen hours. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a situation once where we flew into a Calouette and we couldn't fly out. I don't even remember why, because there's happened so many times. Um, and they were out of hotel rooms in the in the community. So we have this plane full of, full of people who don't know each other and no more hotel rooms left in the community. So literally they're like, well, find someone that you can stay in a bed with because that's what's happening tonight. So I've got staff that have never, and we're like, two staff in a bed and one in a bathtub, like this is like, like there's just not enough housing space. And I've slept on couches and I've slept in airports and I've slept not slept because you're just, your travel up there is very much if something goes sideways or, you know, a plane doesn't go, there is very few planes and not enough like of anything. And so you can just be sitting somewhere for a long, long time. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a very, very interesting way. I flew once. That same time that I got just got trapped in the hotel there, I think we were two days before we flew back out or into community. We were on our way up. So then I, there wasn't enough room. So I flew with my one staff and we left two more staff behind to fly in, I think it was. And we flew into the community and we got all the way into community. So bear in mind, we're two days. We're trying to come into community. It's a beautiful day out. We circled the community. So we're an hour out of, of a Callaway. We are quite close to a Callaway. We circled the community. We're circling it. And the pilot comes on and he says, sorry, we can't land. We have a, a light that's come on. So they cannot land if something goes wrong on the way because there's it's a gravel runway and they don't turn the plane on. They turn around and go. So if anything happens, you there's nothing there. Like they can't get the plane back out because there's nothing. It's just a gravel runway and a, a little room for an airport. And so they said, sorry, we can't. So we flew all the way back to Calaway. 
got off the plane, waited a few hours for them to fix it, and then flew back into Oh, Canada. wow. And you have to be okay with that. Like, if you're not, you you can't work up there. Like, it just, you no. have to be okay no. with that. It's just, yeah. A gravel runway. <laughs> oh, yes. They're all gravel runways. And uh -huh. when in the winter time, when it snowed, they're basically a snow ice field. <laughs> you okay. On. All right. And uh, in King I, in, in Hanum, it's the same way. You sort of, because it's just you're landing on pieces of the tundra, right? So the ocean is always around you. You're coming in, you know, yeah. on, the, on that east end, you're always around. But where I was flying in and out of in King I, the way the airport is structured, the landing is sort of ocean here and ocean here. So, and then your landing is right here. So either way, you're coming in over the ocean and you're open to goodness. Jeez, and you see this tiny little, like, oh man, I oh tell man. you. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. like Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Their runway is right in the middle. There's water yeah. on either side of you. The runway. Either side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So now tell me a little bit about um, the spiritual side. You know, do they have mm -hmm. traditional ceremonies? Do they have traditional uh, beliefs, uh, are, you know, are the churches there? Did they get infiltrated with that? Uh, yes. what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, um, a bit different from the sense of, you know, from a uh, first nations community and, and what we would know as, you know, pipe ceremonies and, and, you know, powwows and dances and things like that, that, that is, a, they are different in that regard for sure. Um, but they are a spiritual people and there is a lot of stories that get passed down, um, that are, are beautiful stories. Um, their stories and their values get passed down um, to the children um, from that that standpoint. And the um, the the animals, um, I if you will, like there there's spirituality attached to sort of you know nature and, and animals oh, yes. and things okay. like that. Um, mm -hmm. They did get in, infiltrated, yes, with the residential schools. Um, there was they did have one. What made a more profound impact was they had some priests that came through um, a number of the communities and there was a couple in specifically that just pillaged a few communities and the community that I was in had been utterly and completely pillaged by this man and that those communities hands down have had more issues than other communities because of the legacy that that person left. Um, and so that impact has been very, very profound, um, a bit, a bit different than the residential schools. Um, it would be the, the, the men that had come in. I mean, certainly there was the impact of the residential schools. There was the impact of really, um, a lot of the stories I heard, like the individuals that are older in, in Nunavut, um, they they remember the first time they ever heard English. They remember the first time wow. they ever saw a white man. And they talk about it. Um, and so when the Americans started bringing in the dew line, so the Americans came up and started bringing in that dew line, which is that protection line that we have up in the Arctic. That was the first time they really started to see white, white men in some of these communities. And then the trade started. So it's really fascinating to sometimes listen to some of these older individuals who tell, talk about this because these are things that I read in textbooks and that really didn't happen in our generation because we read about these things in textbooks. We don't, they didn't happen. They haven't happened in, in anybody close to any of our generations. Whereas up there, they still remember what it's like, um, what it's been like around the trade and what it's been like around building community and things like that. Um, and so that was very interesting to me to listen to them talk about losing their culture, but then retaining their culture and, and how some of them navigated that. Um, it, it just, it's very, it, it, to me, it just was, it explained a lot. And it was, I, I just thought so many times, I wish that these stories could get out about how this has been for people. Um, because I think we would understand the culture better. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the reasons we're going to revive my show, Voices of Indigenous People, VIP, very important people. Yeah. Uh, because we need the platform to be able to give people a place to share those stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just did a show and you were there the next morning. Um, on Monday, I interviewed the family of, the, of uh, Dexter Adams, who lost his braids in the hospital at the hands of a nurse who didn't know what she was doing. And um, that's just ignorance. That's just lack of knowledge, lack of experience. Um, so share with me now um, on the dark side of things, um, 
obviously the addictions and the suicides and the crime is there as well in yeah. a, a in an extraordinary way. Yes, it's, it's different than we would see here. So it's alcohol. Okay. And there is very much significant research that Inuit individuals metabolize alcohol quite a bit different than I would um, and that other cultures would. The alcohol is, you know, there, there has been some drugs, but very little. So it's a very unique situation to work in because you're not dealing with the need for Narcan or, you know, some of those other that we would deal with down here. You're dealing with alcohol um, and you're dealing with mental health. So typically what I dealt with um, when I was in and out of community working was a lot of mental health breakdowns, um, suicide ideation, and, you know, somebody who maybe should have been on medications or was on medications and they're not working. Um, and so I did a lot of work within the community um, and, and, you know, sort of talking to some of the RCMP. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say sort of talking. I, I worked alongside the RCMP members at times, helping them to understand what they were dealing with. Um, and that that person wasn't being ignorant or religion, relig belligerent, but that person, you know, I can think of one situation where a, a young lady, she's probably in her mid forties. By the time I was dealing with her, she was having quite a significant mental breakdown. Um, she had been raped, I think at least twice. Ooh. And she, the, she had been in a uh, domestic relationship in which he had physically attacked her and for lack of a better, the only way to explain it is basically curb stomped her head, which had caused brain damage. Right. Um, and so when you look at that, then you can look at that person totally different when there is a situation. And those were some of the, that's some of the knowledge translation that I think needs to happen. And that's not just in, in, in Inuit communities, that is in all communities. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, I feel, I feel very strongly um, about policing from the standpoint of Many of these members, like I, I, in a lot of ways, I will defend members who just don't know any different. They went to school to be an RCMP or, or a police officer. And here they are dealing with something that they have no idea how to deal with. They are in this tiny little community. They have to follow rules around risk and, and, you know, making sure that somebody's safe. Those rules around how we measure risk and how we keep somebody safe, they don't always align with how we work in the mental health field. And so it's, you know, we, in a lot of ways, yeah, I hear people, you know, sort of bashing the, the police for, for the, and I think, yeah, you know, until you sat in a community and you've watched, like I, are these members that I was working with and, and my teams as well too, we were on 24 seven. It never stopped. You would have people that would come up to the house. They would knock on your door in the middle of the night. They're having a complete meltdown. You're never off. And so I think from that perspective, when we have, we have to look at who we're sending into some of these communities, because the sheer level of help that's needed, you have to be ready for. And there was times in the community where, I mean, it's, you know, you don't want to, I don't want to necessarily talk ill about the communities, but we knew when the plane was coming in with alcohol on it and we knew what that night was going to be like. And I was, um, you know, up there when there was a shooting during the night um, because alcohol had come into the community. And it is stressful and it is hard. It is hard on every one of the professionals that can just see the freight train coming and know that we need to deal with things differently, but we're hand tied and everybody has a job to do and you have to do that job, whether or not we agree with how the job is being done or not. So I think there's a lot of things we could do differently, but that is a system change of a very big shift that needs to be moved. I understand what you're saying, right? Well, we have a saying, um, one of the challenges we have, um, and this doesn't, re I'm not talking about your professionals that you just referred to, but, you know, we have a lot of unhealthy people trying to help unhealthy people. And I had a group of young men at my lodge back in the day, and there were 10 of them there between the ages of 16 and 18, and they were just leaving the foster care system. You know, they were going to be out. And uh, one of the kids came up to me and said, but Lori, my addictions counselor is a dealer in our community. Yeah. <laughs> like, how does that work? Yeah. yeah. Right. And there's yeah. a lot of that going on. Yeah. With And you're right. And it's, it's a bit of, and I think I shared this story with you the other day and I'll share it again. 
Yes. You know, we're, we're trained, you know, myself, of course, from the background I have, you're trained to come in and you're trained to do community collaboration and you need, you need to talk to the communities before you come in. And yes, I agree with that. We should not be rolling in and thinking that we can change or do things. And that, you know, that's, that's wrong approach to have. Um, but there is an approach that is somewhere in the middle. And, and I, when I was up in Nunavut, a, a wonderful older elder, she took me aside um, because I was approaching it from a community co uh, consultation and what, what does everybody need? And, you know, tell us what you need and how we can help. And, and she took me aside, she said, Jessica, no, this community is on fire. If a building is on fire, you wouldn't come and ask, well, you know, how do you think we should deal with this? You would get a hose and start putting it out. And then we would have some conversations about what we could save and what we can't and what's going to happen. And she said, you've got to treat this like you cannot come in when we are in such crisis and the fire is so big and start asking people how to help. We don't know. You need to help us to know what we even have access to. And for someone like me who you know spent so many years and you're so trained, you know, just that I, I still am profoundly impacted by that statement years later because it is so it sounds so counterintuitive to what you know we're trained to do. And and we don't want to roll in. But then you look at that and you think, okay, back to the story about you and I with cancer. You know, I don't know about your journey, but nobody ever asked me, you know, well, you know that that's not what they asked you they said here's your appointments you need surgery i mean they do you know you do of course consent to the process but they don't sit down and go well you know what do you think you need talk to us about what you think you need can you imagine if you have oh. a tumor and they sat down and said can you talk to us about what you think you need you're the surgeon tell me what i need right yeah and so when i started thinking about it that way i went okay no there's a different way to approach this there is community collaboration while taking in like you can do both of those things simultaneously Absolutely. Absolutely. and that is where i've had success in my career is knowing where to go down the middle of still commuting obviously still having that but also going in and taking some of those life-saving services in and doing some of that bottom end you know capacity building before we even start getting people involved um, and I, I saw that happen time and time again, where, you know, the government would say, well, in order to do this program, you need to have community collaboration. And I'd go back to them and I'd say, fabulous, here's all the things we've tried and nobody showed up. So what do you want us to do? You can't ask people to show up when it's all they can do to live that day. They're, they don't have capacity to show up. Stop asking them to show up. Let's bail them out a little bit. Um, and that goes for everyone. I mean, you think about that, even, you know, new mamas with babies, you know, we, we take them food, we take them things. We don't sit down and go, okay, tell us what you need. You know, yeah. we all know I what need they food. need. I need food. I need clothes. Take right. them food. Take them clothes. Let them have a shower. You know, we kind of, it's kind of, so I look at it that way now a little bit more of in so many aspects of being a human, we know, and we go and step in places without necessarily asking because where you see a child that needs help, you go help that child. You don't necessarily, so I think we need to look that way more uh, maybe a little bit more than we already do when we're looking at helping vulnerable communities. Well, I think we need to look at it a lot more, <laughs> not even just a little more, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. But if and there's I love a risk that analogy. Associated. Yeah. And I love that analogy of the burning building. Mm -hmm. I love that. And thank you for yeah. sharing that on the show. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right. Well, I think our time is up. Can you believe that our time has gone by so quickly? And you've just a you're just a big whole pile of information and knowledge. And uh, I really appreciate you being here today because I've learned a lot from you today. And um, it uh, you know you've got the experience, and that's what matters. And uh, I know you're very highly credentialed as well. But we do a little workshop: the difference between credentials and credibility. And if you have one, if you have one and not the other, uh, forget it. Uh, but if you have both, uh, that makes us, turns us into a fireball. And so, <laughs> yep. so thank you for that. Thank you for that. All right. Well, you've been watching the Today Show here on the Disability Channel. And thank you again, Jessica, for being here. Thank and you. if you had a crowd of uh, people in front of you that really were as passionate as you and I are, about supporting and and um, I don't know that we can help anybody really unless they're willing to be helped but um, you know that we have some things to bring to the table uh, what is it that you would say to them 
you know, to encourage that they continue their journey the way you and I have. I think from my perspective, education is key. Mm -hmm. uh, because education then brings with it compassion. You know, as soon as you understand a topic, when you understand what addictions actually is, or when you understand, you know, where poverty comes from, or some of these larger scale, I think we have much more compassion for ourselves and for everyone around us. And I think that is the key for how we look at some of these issues that we have going on across our country right now is let's educate ourselves. Let's talk about the real stories. Let's talk about the real, not, not the, not the things that we think or not the rumors or not the old school practices. Let's really educate and let's really listen to people who are living and working in it and take that knowledge and transfer it now. And I think that would make us a much more compassionate and a, a much more um, well society. Absolutely. And in a, in all of that, uh, then we become more effective we do in what we're doing we do. so we do. Mm -hmm. all right well once again my my guest today Jessica Hutton and uh, experienced northern traveler exp <laughs> experienced with all of the uh, information that you shared today I don't think there was one aspect of that that you didn't cover so so thank you so very much and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow my guest will be Sylvia Somerville a uh, beautiful client uh, started out as a client of mine only for me to find out that she had actually written and published 32 books. And so we brought her on board last year and we did a pilot workshop and uh, she said, well, if somebody wants to have a bestseller, you know, there's 18 essential ingredients you must have in your book to have a bestseller. And I could only name three. So she's a world uh, wealth of knowledge and information when it comes to writing, publishing, illustrating, editing. She does the whole nine yards. She owned a big publishing company back in the day. So uh, that's our guest tomorrow. So bye for now, everybody. Wave goodbye, Jessica. We always wave goodbye, not goodbye, but so long. We'll see you soon. And uh, thank you for being here again. Thank you. Step that road unravels right then left and I'm finally on my own Speaking tongues I babble words unravel despite my thoughts being full of rebel I'm finally on my own Still my words I gather collect what matters hope it works and my brain won't scatter as i drove i thought that i had had her friends and times where i was flatter i'm finally on my own twists and turns the road kept going sideways crossing the lines of a thousand highways